Alan, I know you presented just the preliminary uh, first glimpse of the data at ASCO this year. Can you tell us a little bit about the data? Sure. Um, so what I presented was the, uh, the overall survival data. The, the primary endpoint was overall survival. Uh, and that was actually mandated by the FDA. At the time, this was a registration trial for cetuximab 10 years ago. As, as Chuck alluded to, the trial morphed from the, the three-arm trial, which looked at the double biologics, to two arms, a more straightforward uh, chemotherapy bevacizumab versus chemotherapy cetuximab. It also morphed to only look at wild-type RAS patients. When the study was originated, we, it, we had a 120-page uh, uh, tome on the correlative science, and KRES was not in that original uh, correlative sinus science uh, list. So we, we changed. Uh, it took 10 years for that reason. We took three years to accrue to the original design. It was closed for a year uh, while we amended and then waited for the FDA to decide what was an acceptable RAS, companion RAS test. We reopened the trial, accrued for three years, and then had to follow patients for two additional years. So really what I have now is fresh off the press. It's, it's literally uh, just a couple months old. The data I presented, fundamentally the overall survival across the two arms, again, only the frontline therapy was, was mandated, the, the survival was the same. It was 29.9 months in the patients who received chemotherapy cetuximab and 29.0 months in patients who received bevacizumab plus chemotherapy. The message there is that there's no difference, and really statistically, we didn't presume one would be, which one would be better than the other. We just wondered, would one be better than the other? And one is not better than the other. So, so the, I think it, oh, the 30,000 foot view is that we have overall survival of 29 months in both arms of a study that was done across the U.S. and Canada in many sites, a hundred, over 100 sites accrued patients to this study. So it, I think, can tell us that in general practice, in, at least in, patient, in doctors and patients who are participating in research, the survivor, survivorship is much better than we've seen before, 29 months. That's, a very, that's exciting. Now the devil's in the details and figuring out how we can improve on it. Now we looked at other, I did present progression-free survival as determined by the investigators, which was really marginally different, not statistically significantly different in favor of the chemotherapy bevacizumab patients just by a, 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 a few, uh, less than, a, less than 0.2 months and probably, and certainly not clinic, not statistically significant. We looked at, we had a subset of patients who did very, very well, 10% uh, of patients who actually went to surgery and had, at least for a period of time, were free of disease by surgery and chemotherapy. That's about 10% of the patients. And that subset did very well. We all know that we see patients who live five years and longer, and we never know how many there are. It turns out in this population, about 10% of the patients enjoyed more than five years survival, which is, I think, something to remember when patients ask, how long do I got, doc? I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing you can say. We, the, the final piece that I presented that was ready for presentation was a quality of life, uh, which was exceedingly well done. Actually, some of this was presented a year ago by Michelle Naughton at ASCO, uh, and, and embedded in the protocol was a quality of life of numerous instruments with a compliance of over 90 percent. So, so th this is really very representative. Uh, and they followed patients through nine months. And what that quality of life analysis showed uh, more or less is that while it didn't reach statistical significance, the overall quality of life in the, in the instrument that was used, used the EORTC, benefited, showed bevacizumab a bit better than cetuximab, not quite statistically significant, but almost, with a p-value of 0.056, and that was driven largely by the patient's dissatisfaction with the skin rash. Now, there are many factors here, but, but skin rash patients don't like a skin rash, Although, interestingly enough, uh, and, the, and we can believe in the accuracy of this quality of life instrument because patients most disliked it at six weeks and disliked it less at nine weeks. And in fact, we know that the skin rash d diminishes over time. And also, I, I believe that represents uh, when they get a bad skin rash, they're aware that they may be getting benefit from the treatment. So, so, so I think for all of this, where we have two arms that look about the same, Within the arms, we looked at the full Fury patients and the full Fox patients, although three quarters got full Fox, they also did about the same. I, I think the take-home message 
for, for me is that there are choices here. Patients can choose what the doctors and patients can think about it and choose which treatment works for which patient. And again, we've moved, I think we've created maybe a new expectation that we should be, patients should be doing better than they used to do. That's excellent. I mean, um, Axel, let's put this in perspective. Help mm -hmm. us put this in perspective. So now we have this very large randomized phase three study, mostly full FOX, some full theory, switching biologics, KRAS wild type patients only. We've seen first line studies with each of these different arms alone. We've also last ASCO saw the FIRE 3 study, mm -hmm. um, which suggested a potential survival difference in patients who had received uh, full theory cetuximab versus full theory bevacizumab. What do we do with this now? Huh. You know, I mean, FIRE 3 was probably one of the more puzzling results we've seen and discussed at length. You know, we saw a study designed, a phase 3 study designed with a response rate endpoint, investigator assessed response rate, no difference in response, no investigator assessed response, no difference in progression free survival. And then this late separation of curves, curves clearly out of the control of the initial randomization. Um, at a, about a, a year after patients got off therapy in first line. And we all, I mean, there are some people who jumped on this survival benefit uh, as a secondary endpoint and changed their standard of care. I know there are guidelines in Germany. This is a German trial which were changed to reflect this uh, result. The data got better when you, had, when you moved from KRAS, Exxon 2, to all RAS analysis. Um, but there are a lot of people who said, you know, we need to wait for a larger trial with an appropriate endpoint, if you're really looking at overall survival difference here to guide your treatment, um, 84.5 was the, the way to go. So the uh, CLGB SWAG trial was the kind of a, in, in some ways, you looked at the validation or refuting trial. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I mean, the FIRE 3 data were not confirmed. I mean, you can talk about fall fox and fall fury. We can talk about is there some interaction between antibody and chemotherapy backbone. I think this is not teased out perfectly yet, because especially since we don't have this all RAS analysis, which we'll likely talk about. But even the data that um, um, Alan presented, the Fulfiri alone arm in terms of overall survival, it is really like flipped. I mean, it really does not sh replicate the results of FIRE 3 at all. And again, a study with appropriate follow up, appropriate endpoint, et cetera. So if you ask me, so, what do I believe now? Fire three versus uh, <laughs> the yeah, other. you're surrounded by Alan and me. You remember? Oh right my God! <laughs> no, I, I mean, I actually, it's it's reassuring that um, we have two great arm study arms with outcomes which we didn't conceive con consider possible just when the trial was started in terms of duration of survival. So I think it's it's great. We have choices. We can adjust our treatments. And we can use 84 or 5 as a, a treasure trove to really to dive into more detailed analysis, translation analysis. I, I think what Alan really picked is kind of scratched the very surface of all the data we can expect in the next uh, 20 years. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. It's it so takes 10 years to run a trial. It takes 20 years to analyze it. Exactly. So let's go ahead and...